Check out today's piece of Otaku Daikun fan art. Ooh, it's a traditional art of Sakura. The colors and texture are brilliant. She's staring right into my soul. Thank you so much, Nobugard Arts. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. It's time to continue our lore of Fate Grand Order, progressing through the sub-arc Epic of Remnant. After turning little old Fergus into the ultimate bro, we return to our mission of eliminating demon gods. Before that, however, Ritsuka is whisked away into a different world in their sleep. In order to understand what is actually happening here, we've got to learn a bit more about how Fate's universe actually works. More specifically, that Fate is technically a multiverse consisting of various parallel and adjacent worlds, where historical events occur differently. The clearest example of that is in Fate Stay Night itself. The game has three routes, and in each one, Shira winds up with either Artoria, Rin, or Sakura. A lot of people ask which of these endings is canon, but the truth is all of them are. The universe allows for worlds that differ from each other, to an extent. I'll be keeping it as simple as possible, since I feel Nasu gets up his own ass with the techno babble. Essentially, the overarching universe of fate accounts for various possibilities for mankind to follow. That said, the universe is unable to account for all possible worlds, or if you prefer to call them, timelines. It lacks the energy to maintain so many possibilities, and so it decides to cull or trim these worlds down through a recurring process called the pruning theoretical phenomenon. If you watched my lore of Fate Extra, you should already be familiar with the idea as it's used in the game Fate Extella. At certain points in time, known as quantum time locks, the universe trims a lot of the more divergent timelines. The universe has priorities when it trims down its branching timelines, namely preserving the longevity of human progress. There are many timelines that wind up with humanity either going extinct, progressing too quickly, or reaching a dead end of sorts. The universe focuses on these timelines when it comes time to trim them, and the remaining timelines are part of what's called proper human history. Naturally, this is why it's so important for Caldea to resolve singularities. They're hotspots in time where history begins to deviate from what the universe considers proper. Let these singularities influence the world too much, and your world might be destroyed or become a target for pruning. So why am I talking about all of this? For one, because unlike the other chapters of the story so far, Shimosa isn't technically a singularity. Caldea doesn't fully understand this yet, but it's actually a lot closer to a lost belt, something that the next major arc of the story deals with going forward. In fact, now that Getia's incineration is no more, our next major antagonist starts working behind the scenes, starting with Shimosa. So, normally, timelines that deviate from proper human history will be pruned by the universe. But due to the efforts of a mysterious alien god, some of these timelines are preserved, allowed to exist without being pruned. These timelines are called Lost Belts, and Shimosa is more akin to them. It's one of these isolated worlds that continues on as an alternate version of Japan. Now, because the universe is comprised of many timelines, it's also possible for individuals to travel between them. Such is the case for two of Shimosa's stars, Miyamoto Musashi and Amakusa Shiro Tokisada. Between the two of them, Musashi is by far the most enigmatic. In proper human history, Musashi, also referred to as Shinmen Musashi no Kami Fujiwara no Harunobu, was a man who became one of Japan's most talented swordsmen, using his double-bladed Niten Ichiryu style to win the most undefeated duels across the land. Throughout his life, he mastered his techniques, famously defeated his ultimate rival Kojiro Sasaki, and later spent his dying days cooped up in a cave, documenting his lessons as the Book of Five Rings. Heck, a version of this male Musashi is even present throughout most of Shimosa, ranting to himself from the cave. And yet, the Musashi we know in FGO is most definitely a woman. In short, Fate's Musashi is not the Musashi from proper human history. Rather, she's from an alternate world where she was born a woman. This Musashi is less experienced. She's still trying to perfect her craft, and has yet to even encounter Kojiro Sasaki. Thus, she continues her pilgrimage to master the sword, and winds up migrating from her world into others. This phenomena is what Sherlock calls a mobile singularity. While this sounds cool, it's actually a huge burden. She'll never be able to return to her original world, as it has long since been pruned by the universe. On a similar note, 
Caldea's master, Ritska, has an affinity for dreams, and can occasionally manifest in other worlds while sleeping. We first saw this when Edmond Dantes, under the influence of Getia, held Ritska captive in a dream. Apparently, visiting other worlds through dreams is very akin to the ray-shifting process, and continued exposure makes Ritska more prone to this than anyone else. Thanks to this, Ritska and Musashi actually wound up meeting before the events of Shimosa. Basically, Ritsuka went to sleep one night, and during a dream, wandered into an alternate world set on the island of Onigashima. Musashi, on the other hand, encountered a version of the swordsman Yagyu Muninori, provoked him, and took him on in a duel. She tried to escape through a portal between worlds, but not before incurring a strike to the head from Yagyu's blade. This knocked her out, sending her to her next world unconscious. Thankfully, it was the same world Ritsuka had just ventured to, allowing the two of them to meet and befriend each other. Together, they traveled the island, fighting against vicious demons and servants, ending in a climactic battle between Musashi and Tsukeroku, an oni manifestation of one of her defeated foes. Before vanishing, Tsukeroku claimed Musashi could never achieve her goal, and would wander between worlds eternally. But what exactly is her goal? Obviously to perfect her swordsmanship, but what does that look like? Essentially, Musashi aims for her sword to surpass her father's, to reach a state of emptiness called Zero. Practically speaking, it is a state of being where Musashi can witness all the possible outcomes of a fight and make true the one that guarantees her victory. While she's good at doing this in general, she can't hope to perfect this technique without facing strong opponents, specifically an adversary of the opposite philosophy, a swordsman who enters a state of infinity. It's fair to say that this is easier said than done. Thankfully, Musashi was an optimist, and parted with Ritsuka on amicable terms, eventually finding herself in the world of Shimosa. The other world traveler here is the warrior Amakusa Shiro Tokisada. In proper human history, he was a soldier who fought to protect Japanese Christians living under oppression during the Tokugawa regime. He was viewed as a prophet and savior, said to have inherited power from God. Despite his best efforts, however, Countless Christians were massacred in what is known as the Shimabara Rebellion. His forces lost, and he was publicly decapitated after watching his people's abuse and slaughter. However, the Amakusa Shiro we encounter in this chapter is from another timeline where he survived the rebellion, living on with an intense hatred of the Tokugawa lineage. Fueled by this hatred, he too developed an ability to travel between worlds, and left his own world in search of one where he could enact his revenge. For over 20 years, he ventured from one world to another, tragically witnessing the massacre at Shimabara many times. This is where that alien god I mentioned before comes in. In the game itself, we don't hear much about it for a very long time, and as of writing this video, there are still secrets being revealed throughout the Lost Belts released in the Japanese version of the game. Even showing you a picture of the alien god uncensored would be a huge spoiler, and I don't think now is the time to reveal it. Just know that this strange alien god is at work behind the scenes, starting to sow the seeds of conflict for the next major story arc of FGO. It introduces itself to Amakusa Shiro as Satan. This happens to be an alias, but he doesn't know any better. Satan pointed Amakusa to Shimosa, where in 1630, Japan's capital was instead built around Toke Castle. Normally, this world should be incapable of interfering with proper human history but Amakusa saw it as an opportunity to exact his revenge nonetheless. Following Satan's direction, Amakusa Shiro went to Shimosa and met one of the alien god's apostles, the alter-ego servant Ashia Doman. In life, he was a Buddhist sorcerer rivaled with Abe no Seime, the priest who subdued Tamamo no Mai's wrath. Ashia became an enemy of the government, even scheming against other priests in the bureau of Onmyo. In particular, his bouts against Abe no Seime were legendary for the mastery of their spells. He eventually entered the throne of heroes as an anti-hero whose death brought prosperity. When the alien god summoned him, they did so by combining him with other divine spirits, creating what is called a high spirit. It's pretty similar to alter egos like Meltralis and Passionlip, whom we've already covered extensively. In Ashia's case, he was fused with the Aztec goddess Eats Papalotl, the evil Slavic god Chernabog, and the vengeful spirit of Fujiwara no Akimitsu. Given that he's serving the alien god, his motives are concealed, but essentially he's been tasked with trying to turn Shimosa into a true Lost Belt. That's a topic for another time, though. <sighs> to recap, we've got this alternate timeline of Japan we're calling Shimosa. 
It is now home to two different world travelers, Musashi and Amakusa Shiro. As it turns out, having two mobile singularities in a single world causes distortions. In this case, their presence causes various dark monsters to manifest. Between the two of them, Amakusa Shiro has a stronger influence as a mobile singularity and can thus control the monsters. This is helpful for him, considering his aim is to exact vengeance upon the Tokugawa clan. But just how is he going to pull that off? Well, Ashia Dolman has a suggestion, a ritual capable of elevating Shimosa into a genuine threat to humanity. The ritual is similar to a Holy Grail War, in which the souls of fallen servants and civilians gather into a single powerful vessel. In this case, they aim to channel this energy to manifest a castle Amakusa Shiro calls Onredo Castle. It shall serve as a site where they can sacrifice a member of the Tokugawa, casting a curse on the entire family, in effect destroying all worlds where the Tokugawa exist. Hot damn! That'll curse plenty of worlds, including ours in proper human history. To get started, Amakusa and Dolman team up to try and slaughter everyone in Shimosa. Amakusa both summons and gathers a group of servants and warriors to do his bidding, and Dolman carves into them a curse of annihilation that compels them to kill. These warriors, including Ashia Dolman as the Caster of Limbo, are referred to as the Seven Heroic Spirit Swordmasters, each given an alternate cursed name that further deprives them of their autonomy. The Heroic Spirit Swordmasters comprise most of the servants we witness in this chapter, so let's go over them. Perhaps the most tragic of the bunch is the Archer of Inferno, or more accurately, Tomoe Gozen from the Tale of the Heike. Despite being one of Oni kind, Tomoe excelled as a brilliant warrior, fighting on behalf of the Genji clan against the Taira during the late Heian period. Specifically, she fought as a concubine of Minamoto no Yoshinaka, whom she dearly loved. Together, they helped the Genji clan achieve victory, only to later have their alliance betrayed. Yoshinaka gave his life so that Tomoe could escape and ultimately bear their child. Naturally, this means that she has hatred toward the Genji clan that persecuted her husband, but as a servant, she normally puts that hatred aside to protect humanity at large. After all, she was one of the protectors of Uruk during the Babylonian Singularity, fighting to her last in defense of the city walls. In this case, however, Ashia Doman's Curse of Annihilation takes advantage of her dormant grudge, bringing it to the forefront to encourage her to torch entire villages to the ground. In this possessed state, she is delusional, hallucinating the image of her beloved Yoshinaka. Rivaling that tragedy is the assassin of Paraiso, occupied by Mochizuki Chiyome. She was a kunoichi, or female ninja, during the late Warring States period. She served the Takeda clan, but was forever burdened by a curse she inherited from her ancestor Koga Saburo. Back then, Koga went into the depths below Mount Ibuki to rescue his missing wife. This journey took him through the underworld, such that when he returned to the surface, he had been transformed into a snake by the serpent god Yamata no Orochi. While Saburo was eventually healed by monks, Orochi's curse still lingered in his bloodline, carrying to Mochizuki. To quell the curse, to ward off the terrifying snakes that haunted her, she became a shrine maiden, praying to Orochi out of fear. Even without the curse of annihilation, she carries out her lord's orders as an assassin. But if tainted even further, her madness can conjure avatars of Orochi. The next two come as a pair of sorts, the Rider of Kalasutra Hell and the Berserker of Samgata Hell. They are better known as Minamoto no Raiko and Shuten Doji, heroic spirits who already forged a contract with Kaldea during the game's Roshimon and Onigashima events. The ones we see in Shimosa, however, are not the same, as they are separate iterations summoned by Amakusa Shiro. In life, Raiko was the child of a human and an Oni, a hybrid called Ushi Gozen. She was raised in isolation before turning 15 years old, after which she was brought in by her family, the Minamoto clan, to fight on their behalf as Minamoto no Raiko. She went on to slay many monsters and Oni, as the leader of a group called the Four Heavenly Kings. As a slayer of Oni, Raiko once tried to rid herself of her demonic aspect, only to realize doing so would kill her. Thus, she is left struggling to suppress her Oni instincts, and this becomes vastly more difficult under the Curse of Annihilation. Shuten Doji is, by extension, one of the famous Oni Raiko's Heavenly Kings defeated. Among pure-blood Oni, she was high-ranking, governing the Oni of Mount Oe. She was likely the descendant of Yamata no Orochi, with a powerful dragon trait that made her feared as one of Japan's three great monsters. Despite wielding great influence, Shuten Doji indulged in banquets and alcohol, 
which ultimately became her downfall when Raiko and her heavenly kings poisoned her sake and killed her in her slumber. As a servant, her indulgence, combined with the curse of annihilation, make her prone to tormenting her victims. While adversaries in life, Raiko and Shuten Doji serve Amakusa Shiro as a team. Oddly enough, perhaps the strongest swordmaster isn't even a servant at all. Rather, it's Yagyu Muninori, the human who fought our Musashi before we met her at Onigashima. Historically, he was a brilliant warrior and politician during the Edo period, raising the social position of his clan through clever plotting. He served the shogun Tokugawa Hidetada and was a strategist during the Shimabara Rebellion. In proper human history, he was aware of Musashi, but neither met nor dueled with him. The Muninori of Shimosa's world, however, fought the female Musashi and has since yearned for a true duel against her. This becomes his top priority, and after being assured Musashi would return to his world, he joined Amakusa Shiro's Swordmasters as the Saber of Imperio. He maintains his social standing while performing his duties as a Swordmaster beneath an ominous cloak. The last of the heroic spirit Swordmasters was accidentally summoned improperly. This servant, Hozoin Inshun, was meant to be the Lancer of Purgatorio, but was summoned with free will, causing him to explore the land without receiving his curse of annihilation. In life, Inshun was the up-and-coming heir of Hozoin Ryu spearmanship, which was valued for its cruciform-shaped spear that allowed for slicing, sweeping, and thrusting attacks. His mentor, Ine, abandoned the spear, declaring it inappropriate for his Buddhist faith. Inshun, however, balanced both Buddhist practices and the way of the spear, reviving the Hozoin style. He became the strongest Jumonji spearman to ever live, slaying evil spirits before stepping into the realm of gods as the Buddha himself. As a servant, he has no idea who summoned him, but he wanders the land defeating monsters that emerge from under ominous clouds. Of course, Ashia Doman has every intention of finding and converting him soon enough. Before we reach the main narrative, there are three more heroes to introduce. The first is our beloved robo-milf Kato Danzo. In proper human history, the Fuma Ninja Clan was aided during the Edo period by a sorcerer named Kashin Koji. He gifted the clan's first-generation Fuma Kotaro, a Karakuri doll designed to embody Kotaro's techniques. This doll, Kato Danzo, served the Fuma clan as a kunoichi over generations, which took a toll on her body. When she became weak and unable to perform her duties, Kato Danzo took on the role of mentoring the clan's fifth-generation Fuma Kotaro, not only teaching the boy his ninjutsu, but also serving as the best mother a doll like her could ever be. Ultimately, however, by the end of her life, her limbs broke and her body ran out of mana, after which she was recorded into the throne of heroes. In Shimosa, however, Danzo's body was still around. Ashia Doman found and repaired her, but not before erasing all of her memories to make himself her new master. While she's not one of the Swordmasters, she is nonetheless another of Dolman's pawns. Even with all of these strong warriors at their command, Amakusa Shiro and Ashia Doman still acknowledge the genuine threat that the female Musashi presents to their plan. And as a last resort, Amakusa employs the male Musashi's strongest rival, Gojido Sasaki. If you played Fate Stay Night, you'll know him as the Fifth Grail Wars assassin servant. Of course, you'll also likely know him as the Savior of France, an inside joke among the FGO community because he was really useful to new players in Orléans. He's been part of the game's events, but this is technically his first appearance in a major story chapter. So who is this guy? Well, unlike many heroic spirits, who were recorded into the throne of heroes for their famous legends or historical fact, Kojiro's situation is more hazy. He's kind of the end result of a lot of different stories told by word of mouth. Without making this too complicated, however, let's just say he was a swordsman who dedicated his entire life to master a single technique, the Tsubame Gaeshi. It was a technique invented to slay a fleeing swallow by slashing it not only in the center, but also above and below it. These three strikes are performed so quickly that they're essentially simultaneous. Tales exist of Kojiro Sasaki dueling Musashi at Funajima Island, a fight he lost when abandoning his sheath and being crushed by an oar. In Shimosa, Amakusa Shiro encountered him at the Hitachi Mountains as a human and brought him on as a bodyguard. His entire role in this chapter is to hang around Amakusa Shiro's hideout, waiting to battle the female Musashi. As with all the previous chapters of the story, we enter these alternate worlds or singularities and meet various free servants summoned by the counter force. The same is true for Shimosa, but since it's an isolated world with little influence on proper human history, the counter force has less influence over it. 
the best it can do is summon a single free servant to help stop Amakusa Shiro's Onredo castle. This winds up being the saber servant, Senji Muramasa. In life, he was a famous blacksmith who created many demonic swords during the reign of the Tokugawa clan. While he could certainly use a sword proficiently, he had not achieved anything as spectacular as other heroic spirits, and so he hardly felt worthy. Because of this, he was summoned as a pseudo-servant, with his Saint Graf inhabiting a human body, specifically the body of Shiro Emiya. Just like other pseudo-servants, this indicates that Muramasa and Shiro share both physical and mental similarities. Muramasa himself speculates that Shiro might even be his descendant. After first being summoned, Muramasa wasn't exactly aware of his purpose as a servant, instead witnessing as Amakusa Shiro's monsters massacred the people. Eventually, Muramasa stepped in to save two children, Onui and Tasuke, whose parents had just been murdered. He took custody of these orphaned children, raising them as their grandpa while keeping them safe at his hermitage, a blacksmith's workshop surrounded by a protective barrier. Finally! With all that exposition revealed, it's time to cover the events of Shimosa's story. At Kaldea, Ritsuka is conversing with Mashu about meeting the female Musashi in a dream. Coincidentally, Ritsuka falls into a sudden coma, in which their consciousness leaves the body and manifests in the world of Shimosa. It's just like what happened when they dreamed Onigashima, only now much more sudden and severe. Kaldea can't interact with Ritsuka, so instead we find ourselves falling from the sky yet again. Thankfully, Musashi sees us falling and goes in for the rescue. It's an unexpected yet otherwise welcoming reunion. Like before, we team up to explore this new land. It's not long before we encounter Onui and her baby brother Tasuke. They help us confirm the differences between Shimosa and the Japan we remember. Just as they're about to take us to Muramasa's hermitage, the sky goes dark and the armored monsters emerge. After a couple of battles against these vermin, we're saved when Hozuin Inshun rushes in and slays the rest with a single strike of his spear. Inshun explains to us that there's a sorcerer conjuring the monsters and forcing other servants to do his bidding, making it all the more urgent that we deliver the kids to Muramasa. Inshun joins us, but in the midst of a bamboo forest, we're attacked by the Swordmasters beneath a blood-red moon. They demand Inshun surrender, and to buy his time, he stays behind and fights. He does a great job fending off the Swordmasters, but sadly they can't be killed with normal weapons. A solid stab through the Saber of Imperio doesn't do a thing, leaving Inshun vulnerable as Ashia Dolman places the Curse of Annihilation on him, transforming him into the Lancer of Purgatorio. Like the others, his free will is restrained, instead compelled by a thirst for destruction. Sadly, this means that Inshun's now out to kill us. He tries to warn us first, before succumbing to madness and blindly attacking the party. Musashi notes that in this maddened state, Inshun is neither as precise nor skilled as he once was, allowing her to decapitate him. To our horror, though, he simply picks up his severed head and reattaches it. With no way to kill the guy, we're left making a run for it. We find a place to hide in a nearby village, and are essentially powerless in stopping Inshun from slaughtering all the villagers. After the sound of their screams dissipate, we finally make our way to the hermitage, which thankfully seems to be protected by Muramasa's barrier. Obviously, Ritsuka finds Muramasa's appearance familiar, but there's little time for greetings as Inshun shows up and penetrates the barrier with ease. To protect the children, Muramasa counterattacks with a strike that massacres Inshun's body. As the body repairs itself, Inshun remarks how no technique nor blade can kill him if it can't reach his spirit core. Luckily, Muramasa's already made a sword capable of doing just that, the Myojin Giri Muramasa. He considers the blade a failure, as it's unable to cut through fate, and has become a cursed sword with demonic traits. Musashi, however, ain't afraid of no demon sword, and proves herself skilled enough to wield it. With the sword in hand, she is able to properly fight Inshun in a dramatic duel, slaying him due to the rough and unpolished nature of his madness. While it's great to conquer an adversary, Musashi is angered by how the Curse of Annihilation disrespects and urges great heroes to commit atrocities against their will. Muramasa takes us in for a bit, and explains he's aiming to craft a blade capable of severing bonds, certainty, and karma, basically fate itself. Since the Myojingiri is a failure, he gives it to Musashi. Our group now has another goal, to stop the Swordmasters from their rampage. For that, we require more information than Muramasa can provide, so we set out to the capital, Toke Castle Town, to gather intel. Muramasa stays behind, trusting Ritsuka and Musashi to protect Onui and Tasuke along the journey. When we arrive, we meet Otama, a girl who looks exactly like Tamamo no Mae. 
In this alternate world, she's no Kami with special powers, but rather a humble geisha who owns an inn. Similarly, we meet Kiyohime. Again, she is not the Kiyohime Kaldea knows, but rather the daughter of Lord Matsudaira. Her role is more prominent, being the princess of Shimosa province. These two may not be the people we know from our world, but we nonetheless make friends with them. So, this entire time so far, we've been seeing things from Ritsuka's dream consciousness, but her main body is still comatose back at Kaldea. The staff there aren't just goofing around, they've been trying to help Ritsuka however they can. Specifically, Da Vinci has been trying to send servants into Shimosa to help Ritsuka, but her attempts keep failing. Sherlock, on the other hand, takes a different approach. After all, Caldea does have one servant who can pretty much go wherever he pleases, that being Edmond Dantes. His legend of escaping Chateau d'If means he can escape any confine, including the boundaries between worlds. Thanks to this, Sherlock convinces Dantes to head to Shimosa and save Ritsuka. That said, Da Vinci does eventually succeed in getting one servant through to Shimosa, that being the heroic spirit Fuma Kotaro V. Because of this, Dantes doesn't directly intervene. Instead, when Ritsuka finds him at Toke Castle Town, he points them to where they can find Fuma Kotaro. This is the first time Kotaro's appeared in this series, so let's go over him real quick to understand just why he was the only Chaldean servant to make it through to Shimosa. In life, he was born to be the ultimate shinobi. His blood was fused with that of an oni, giving him an extra edge in performing as a ninja. In contrast, his personality was never suited for the role, rendering him more of a shut-in than a warrior. You might have noticed already, but this Fuma Kotaro is the same boy raised by Kato Danzo, whom I already covered. It's because there was a version of Danzo in Shimosa that Kotaro was able to be summoned. Ritsuka finds him collapsed in an alleyway, and takes him to Otama's inn to recover. While we remain at Toke Castle Town for a time, Amakusa Shiro 6 Tomoe goes in on the surrounding villages. After murdering the innocent villagers in droves, she heads to Toke Castle to fight Musashi in a duel among the city streets. As Musashi deflects Tomoe's arrows, she notices that Tomoe is holding back. Sure enough, this isn't meant to be their main battle, and Tomoe flees town. The next morning, Yagyu Muninori and an army of samurai come to town, declaring their intent to quell the monster epidemic. As I've already explained, however, he's secretly the Saber of Imperio, and most wants to finish his duel with Musashi. Before that happens, however, he continues serving the government, leaving none the wiser. In that endeavor, he recruits Ritsuka and Musashi to help ambush Tomoe Gozen outside the town. Why would he do this if he's the enemy? Well, just like any other Holy Grail war, mana is gathered from both innocent victims and defeated servants. It's actually in Amakusa Shiro's favor to have Musashi fight the Swordmasters. To keep tabs on the party, however, Kato Danzo is tasked with escorting us while keeping her allegiance concealed. As expected, Fuma Kotaro recognizes Kato Danzo as his mother, but because of Ashiya Doman's sabotage, she doesn't remember him as her son. Kotaro keeps this a secret. Ah, uh, how tragic. Despite this, it appears Kato Danzo senses something special about him, and his kindness makes her question her loyalty to Doman. Either way, she guides Ritsuka's party across a mountain pass toward Tomoe Gozen's current location. There, Musashi puts an end to Tomoe's rampage, striking her down as she thinks of her beloved Yoshinaka. Back at Toke Castle, we receive word that someone is threatening to assassinate Kiyohime, so we're hired to stay at the castle itself as bodyguards. That night, Mochizuki Chiyome infiltrates the castle, killing the guards with snakes. Fuma Kotaro and Musashi fight this assassin, and shield Kiyohime from a pair of thrown kunai. Chiyome finds herself outmatched, and uses an illusion to escape. Shuten Doji, however, doesn't think Chiyome's giving it her all, and decides to connect her heart and brain to Orochi's power. Out of fear of Orochi's curse, Chiyome normally rejects these powers, but now she is forced to embrace them, and returns to the castle for a rematch. This time, she summons Orochi, and while Kotaro and Musashi fight the creature, Chiyome takes control of Kiyohime's mind. Kiyohime is compelled to murder Ritsuka with a fire spell, but Kotaro arrives just in time to take the hit for us. As the group listens to Kiyohime ranting about fearing snakes, Musashi is able to deduce Chiyome's real identity. With the Orochi slain, Chiyome is backed into a corner, giving her all in a duel with Musashi. Chiyome is slain, and after her defeat, Kotaro notes that her kunai have yet to disappear. The Orochi's corpse also remains, and so Shuten Doji secretly gathers its body for her poison. 
hoping to keep the capital's citizens out of the conflict. Ritsuka's party returns to Muramasa's hermitage. There, we learn that Raiko and Shuten Doji are massacring entire armies on the battlefield. Before we can fortify the workshop, however, Onui and Tasuke are captured on their way to the toilet. Raiko and Shuten Doji take the children to the top of a nearby mountain, demanding that Ritsuka meet them before noon, else they murder their hostages. Along the mountain path, we're attacked by another Orochi, this one summoned by Shuten Doji. Musashi, Kato Danzo, and Fumakotaro slay the beast, but in its final moments, it manages to knock Ritsuka down the mountain slope. We wake up in a cave, unable to move as Shuten Doji taunts us. She attempts to recruit us to her side, but when we demand she return Onui and Tasuke, she begins to tear into our stomach, stirring around our insides. The intense pain knocks us out, and we awaken later to find that Shuten Doji has spared us. What the hell was that all about? Musashi and Kotaro come to our rescue. They heal our wounds, and after resting some more, we finally reach the peak of the mountain. Raiko and Shuten Doji talk a big game, claiming to have eaten the children. But after they're both defeated by Musashi's blade, they reveal the children are safe at a nearby shrine. Onui confirms that neither she nor her brother were harmed. If anything, Raiko reminded them of their mom. It seems the two Oni were desperately trying to resist the curse of annihilation, and in their final moments, they ask Ritsuka to defeat the other Swordmasters. At this point, the only remaining Swordmasters happen to be Saber and Castor. Preparations for materializing Onredo are complete, so Amakusa Shiro begins the ritual. Once more, the sky is plunged into darkness with a crimson moon. Toke Castle transforms into Onredo and many of the townspeople vulnerable to magecraft are transformed into monsters. Otama helps protect whatever survivors she can, but is unable to stop Kiyohime from being captured by the enemy. As it turns out, Kiyohime has blood ties to the Tokugawa, making her fit to be sacrificed in Amakusa Shiro's ritual. On horseback, Ritsuka, Musashi, Muramasa, and Kato Danzo ride to the castle town, leaving Onui and Tasuke in Otama's care. We venture into the castle, hoping to somehow destroy it. Kato Danzo leads us to the courtyard, before revealing that she's been an enemy spy this entire time. She's surprised to learn we all suspected it already, but we could also see that she truly wanted to do good. She claims to have guided us as a gesture of friendship, a sign that she's gained a soul to rebel against Ashia Dolman. Right on cue, however, Dolman shows up and mocks Danzo for thinking she's gained a will of her own. He asserts that he's been controlling Danzo this entire time, and proceeds to compel her to fight us. During the fight, he forces her to self-destruct, and the ensuing explosion injures Musashi's eye with a curse that prevents it from healing. We're unable to keep up against Dolman's monsters, but Kato Danzo begins to remember her past before she dies. She recalls being a mother to Kotaro, and ceases to function in his arms. While sad, Danzo leaves behind a legacy, the techniques and essence of the first Fuma Kotaro, which transfer into our Kotaro, causing an ascension in his saint graph. Our newly upgraded ninja helps us both defeat the monsters and prevent Musashi from receiving the Curse of Annihilation. Ashiya Dolman makes his final stand, summoning a great spirit to fight on his behalf, only to suffer as Musashi slays the spirit and Kotaro slays him. It's at this point that Ritsuka can finally get back in contact with Kaldea. Why now of all times? According to Sherlock, Ritsuka's magic circuits weren't properly adjusted for Shimosa's world. This means that when Shuten Doji was playing with our innards, she was actually configuring us to be able to reach Kaldea again. Huh, so two of the most difficult opponents in this chapter were doing their very best to resist their curse. Good on them. Would have been nice to know when Ritsuka was screaming in agony. I wonder if the manga will ever get far enough to show us that. Anyway, on the castle's fourth floor, Ashia Dolman, still alive as a high servant, makes another attempt to attack us. To our surprise, he's struck down by the Saber of Imperio. He reveals himself as Yagyu Muninori, and explains that his alliance with Dolman and Amakusa Shiro is only a means of getting his chance to duel Musashi again. Musashi respects this effort, and obliges Yagyu with his requested duel. She and Ritsuka stay behind as Muramasa and Kotaro move forward. Turns out, Yagyu is the perfect opponent for Musashi, because during their battle, she awakens to her ultimate attack. Kengo Bato, Ishana Daitensho. She can now finally reach the state of zero she's been aiming for. Despite this loss, Yagyu thanks her for the duel before dying. 
Thankfully, we reach the top floor where Amakusa Shiro resides before he has the chance to sacrifice Kiyohime. While fighting, Muramasa realizes he was summoned specifically to stop Amakusa Shiro's ritual, as the counterforce deemed it a colossal threat. Even so, we can't seem to harm the bastard, and the situation gets worse when Amakusa Shiro invokes his reality marble, Shimabara Hell. We are taken to the toxic land where Amakusa Shiro's Christian brethren were slaughtered. Left alone, we are fated to suffocate and die among the chaos. But Muramasa has other plans. He uses this opportunity as a servant to finally forge his ultimate blade, the Tsumugari Muramasa. His genuine worth as a hero is in the weapons he creates, and he uses this scorching blade to slice Onredo Castle in two, setting it ablaze as the reality marble fades around them. Kotaro takes this opportunity to pierce Amakusa Shiro with the kunai Chiyome left behind. Apparently, Muramasa's blade was divine, so powerful that only gods could wield it properly. As a result, using it even once causes him to disappear. As the castle burns to the ground, Kotaro rescues Kiyohime, but just before Ritsuka and Musashi make their own escape, they encounter Kojiro Sasaki, who's been waiting all this time. Once more, Musashi accepts the challenge, dueling him even though she has nothing to gain from it. Ritsuka stands by and watches as the two swordsmen unleash their opposing techniques. Musashi's style is zero, which arrives at a single result from many possibilities. In contrast, Kojiro's style is infinity, which creates possibilities. These styles collide, allowing the warriors to reach the realm of nothingness, a place meant only for true masters. It contains neither time nor space, neither good nor evil, just the eternal clashing of swords. The only reason their fight comes to an end is that Ritsuka declares Musashi the winner. While this appears to be an arbitrary decision, Kojiro accepts it and leaves the castle satisfied. Musashi, on the other hand, is too weak to escape. She uses the last of her strength to yeet Ritsuka out the window, trusting Kotaro to catch them on the ground below. She remains in the castle and dies among the flames. In the aftermath, Ritsuka acknowledges that they can never return to this world again, and decides to part with it after saying farewell to Onui and Tasuke. Beforehand, Ritsuka digs through the castle remains, only to find the Tsuba Musashi used as an eye patch. After Ritsuka returns to Kaldea along with Kotaro, Ashi Adoman emerges to reveal that he is still alive. He's like a friggin' cockroach. While talking to himself, he admits that calling the alien god Satan was a joke that he took too far. Back in our own world, we wake from our coma, and ironically, we're told that we should go get more bed rest because what we just went through wasn't exactly quality sleep. As we head back to our room, we thank Edbon Dantes for helping us, though he stubbornly pretends it wasn't him. He's a tsundere. Regardless, he leaves a recorded message in our room that reveals Musashi revived as a heroic spirit following the fire. She's been registered as a servant of Caldea, and while she still intends to continue traveling between worlds, she says she will always be there to fight when we need her. Sweet! Hmm, I just hope she can actually keep that promise. And with that, we've completed the third official epic of Remnant. Now all that's left is Salem, so look forward to it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and, most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of my anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. If you want to support me directly, there are now three ways that all provide the same benefits. You can click Join here on YouTube, or join Patreon or Subscribestar for access to exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate your fandom!